you know, there's the operations people who understand their day-to-day -day job. There's the project managers who know how to manage a project. Um, there's strategists, business analysts, coders, but there's a breed that's coming out of big data that's called data scientists, which mm -hmm. is people who actually understand data or have the intellectual curiosity of figuring out data in ways that haven't been figured before. Um, my own personal professional opinion is that the fact that we call them scientists, we've put them in a pedestal that makes them very hard to reach, very hard to hire. Everybody thinks about those PhDs in a room somewhere, you know, with a lot of uh, mathematical equations. And there's some truth to that. But um, at the same time, I think we're missing the opportunity of taking some really smart people who are just naturally curious and cultivating them to be for lack of a better word, just better analysts. And um, Steve, you, you have a view in terms of what are data scientists and, and some questions around that as well. So, Yeah, I have a very strong view us. there. And um, I, I had lunch with Ray Manganelli, who uh, I know here from AMCF. And I, I was thrilled. He's gone over to academia. And he introduced me to a couple of people I sat with who are PhDs who are getting MBAs after their PhD. Fantastic. Because I believe, I, I call it my book, The Hybrid Employee. Um, you know, data scientists, what's new? Haven't we had you know, nerds and technicians and for, for a long time? Yeah, the technology changes. But the problem is taking a team where you have the business analyst, MBA, who has a very slight acquaintance with technology but really doesn't want to be a tech techie. And then you've got deep technologists who can talk business but aren't particularly oriented that way. You know, what's changing, I think, and, and, and let's call them data scientists. Let's call them anal okay. analytics people. The, the name isn't so great, but we want people who are deep technologists, and not just because they know how to program in Java, but they love the stuff. They love the stuff. They really like learning new technologies, because you better, because if you don't, you're going to end up as IT. You know, what happened to those people? Now they're, now they're like the, the Politburo. They're fighting change. What? No, we want the people who will be running IT because they love new stuff, and they also have the interpersonal side, the business side. It's not like they can, they can talk to business people without drooling. It's they actually have great emotional intelligence, and they're really engaged. They want to get better at their people skills. You, you bring those kind of people together, Katie Parr, we're all trying to hire those people, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Verizon, IBM, Princeton, and so we're, you're, we're all trying to hire those people. So if you guys have kids like I do, college age, if they have any shot at being hybrid employees, not just, hey, you should learn Java, you should learn Hadoop, you should learn, you know, but if, if you can combine them so that they've got the management consulting skills, traditional management consulting skills, and, uh, and deep technology skills, boy, that's, that's valuable. So I, no, I'm, I'm very, uh, very passionate about this. Is, yeah. is there a gap? Um, I'll ask Tom that because Tom uh, is in the middle, I think, of, of this maturity curve of some of those tools and some of those capabilities in the industry. Um, is there a gap uh, between where the tools and the technologies are today and their accessibility to the mass users that can actually interact with them in a, in a smart way that requires those deep technology and analytical expertise? And is that gap starting to converge and close towards uh, those of us who know where Hadoop grew up and, and the open source, these are command line tools and they're um, requiring the knowledge of Java and coding and mathematical equations and formulation. Um, and then there's a plethora of now uh, startups. In fact, since we started this panel, there's probably five more in Silicon Valley just started uh, that are trying to bring more capabilities to the front end of big data tools and technologies. Um, but there's still a gap. You still need people who are knee in in code. Um, how uh, is the industry shifting towards making these things more user friendly? Yeah, um, sure, good, good question. For, first of all, I, I didn't know anyone actually reads that crap I put out on LinkedIn, so that's <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you guys got to find better stuff to do, right? Um, the, uh, uh, so, a, a couple, couple thoughts here. One is uh, Bob Suter, who's a, a colleague of mine at IBM Research, um, uh, hates the term data scientist because it implies that all you need is to get one and everything's okay, right? And, and, and his observation after managing people that had the, that skill set before it was named is there's no one person that can do it all, right? So the people that generally gravitate to understanding business and, and so forth really well are not necessarily oriented towards, you know, writing code who are not necessarily people that have a strong stats background, right? It is certainly possible to have all that in one package. 
but those people are hard to find. So one idea is don't try to hire a data scientist. Try to hire people that can together perform the role of data science. Right? Uh, and that changes the perspective of how you look at it quite a bit. Um, the, the other thing that, that I think to answer your, your question directly is, and like any other sort of, of technology or management issue, uh, it gets easier with time, both in terms of, of you're having more practice yourself, but also the maturation in the industry around you that you, know, you don't necessarily uh, you know, uh, are, are having to be the first ones to do something. And that's certainly not the case today, by the way. I, one of the things I tell my customers is if anyone comes in here, including us, and, and talks about all this stuff and, and generic use cases, a lot of them being B2C, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the examples they give are the same ones that the other vendors give. Just throw them out the window. You decide whether you open it or first and how many floors up you are, right? <laughs> but they, 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 the world's moved on, right? This is not new stuff at this point in time, right? So I, I think that there's just a body of practice that's there to be tapped into. From a technology point of view, this is going to get easier and easier over time, right? So, so like most you know, hardcore technologies, they start off basically you know, by technologists for technologists. And then people say, this is kind of useful, and then grudgingly they get a little bit easier to use. And then as you start getting other people that, you know, that, that are farther away from it, they demand more and more abstraction just because they need it to work. In other words, more UI-friendly uh, sort of behaviors. And pretty soon you get to something that hides a lot of the complexity. Now, th there is a danger in all this, which is that one of the things I caution my customers about is, so, so agility, great. Let's boil a bathtub, great. Uh, let's, let's, let's pick something and, and run it to the ground. Make sure you're not accelerating your time to finding bad information, right? right? So one of the things that, that is, is true and, and um, uh, you know, has, has been written about is that you, you, just being able to find correlations doesn't mean that you know, there, there's any validity to it, right? I don't need to spend time explaining that. If you don't have the skills to determine how valid the output is, you're just accelerating potentially time to for value. So one of the things that, that we're going to start to see in terms of making this more consumable is two things. One, speeding up getting answers. And the second is help in, in essentially interrogating whether or not those answers are correct. So let me, let me give you examples of both. And forgive me because I happen to work for IBM, but I'll talk about our stuff for a second. So there's, there's a project that we're going to release uh, commercially uh, in about three months that we called NEO. And NEO combines some of the things that we did with Watson with some of the things we've done on the data side, right? And the idea, the idea behind NEO is really straightforward, which is, actually, let me, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. So, so what is the single most powerful query tool, very precise, very sophisticated, very nuanced, nuanced query tool that every single one of you in the audience and every single one of your employees has? Language. It's not technology. It's language. So the question we ask is, okay, everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows how to express what they're interested in learning. So what if we let them just type that in in normal language, and the system, not using lots of data but using lots of compute power, was able to accurately interpret that into the math, right? So you can ask it, what products are most impacted by the weather, right? And we interpret that, right? and know, okay, that's what the person's trying to solve. And then if you literally just drag and drop the data set on top of it, we will marry the two out, and then we will attempt to give you the right answer. We don't always get it right, right? We make it clear when we get it wrong, so you say, no, that's a bonehead thing, and we try not to do that again, right? Now, notice that there, there are two very important things happening here. One is we're, we're making it a lot easier to get the answer, but we're being humble enough to know that that answer is not always going to be right, and we're asking you to help train us, right? And over time, that starts to build in feedback mechanisms where we know whether or not the answers that we're helping you generate quickly are actually worth having been generated. Right? So, so my suggestion would be, as we think about this, there's been a lot of focus on the back-end technologies and rationalizing those. That, in my opinion, is a fool's errand. Right? What's going to happen is those are going to proliferate. You're going to have much more moving parts in the back-end. What you're going to use big data to do, for the most part, is brute force computing to make it easier for normal people using that query tool we all have, which is called language, to interact with and ask for those data sets, and for us to know whether or not what we're giving you is actually meaningful and statistically valid. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, 
and what, what, what's your view in terms of how the adoption on the front end at the client with the current technologies um, and, and what's the challenges that your users have? How much of hand-holding is there between your systems that process an enormous amount of data and the accessibility of your business decision makers to them? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a good question and it is a challenge kind of everybody's facing right now. I think uh, we're seeing the front end as you know, uh, end user facing tools mature to a point where uh, the more everyday worker can actually use and access information. I think kind of three, four years ago, technologies around in database activities that allows you to do a lot of analytics in the database and then pump it out through traditional BI platforms. Where I think there's less maturity is as we start getting into more predictive and prescriptive spaces. So this sort of descriptive view of the world, seeing your business as it is today, having that information platform, there is a level of comfort and understanding around that. Predictive analytics, starting to see where you could be, you know, the, the forecasting, starting to look forward. There's a smaller group that get that. There's an appetite for it in a smaller, smaller scale, but there is a receptivity to it. Then there's the prescriptive analytics that's getting into your optimization, your operations research toolkit, and really this is sort of a, a, a more advanced analytics toolbox, that's where I think companies are scared to take the risk. Because it does look at it, kind of given a set of options, what's the best decision your company should do? And now you're starting to put a lot of faith into the technology platform that's shifted from being just a decision support mechanism to true decision guidance. But guess what? That's where the nuggets are. That's where you're going to find the game changers. That's where the next thing is going to be found is in that space. And I think that's where the nervousness is. So it's, scriptive analytics, they're OK. You get further away from that, they're mm, a little more risky. When you let the machine take over. Exactly. That, that machine learning uh, can, can become a scary concept when it learns a little too much, right? Yeah. 